Evolutionists constantly ask creationists for a definition for the word kind. Obviously, this is an attempt to distract from the fact that they can't even decide amongst themselves how to define their own word species. In fact, there are at least seven definitions for the word. If these supposed scientists can't even decide amongst themselves how to define their own term, aren't they being a little bit hypocritical? I had to investigate. People have been naming and classifying living things for as long as there have been people. Even the ancient Egyptians made wall paintings depicting basic taxonomy. In the 4th century BC, Aristotle began classifying animals by their features, such as having four limbs, whether or not they laid eggs or had live birth, whether or not they had blood, and even whether they were plants or animals. Many of his classifications are still used today. In the 18th century, Swedish botanist Carolus Linnaeus sought to determine and define the biblical kinds. Utilizing the Aristotelian terms genus, meaning kind, and edos, meaning specific form, Latinized to genus and species, he revolutionized modern taxonomy by standardizing a binomial naming system for animals and plants. In examining the appearance of smaller parts of organisms, he began to notice that different genera shared common characteristics that allowed him to unify genera into larger groups, including orders and classes. It became apparent that this method of classifying organisms could unify all animals into one kingdom we now call Animalia, and all plants into their own kingdom called Plantae. This method of classification, with a few adjustments, is still used today. So we can take the species, including the common house cat, and place it in the genus Felis with the black-footed cat and the jungle cat. All of these species in the genus Felis share similar features with tigers, lions, jaguars, and leopards in the family Felidae. All species in the family Felidae share features with hyenas, mongooses, and civets, placing them all into the suborder Feliformia. All Feliforms share a common jaw design with the same arrangement of teeth as all other species within the order Carnivora, which also shares warm-bloodedness and mammary glands with all other species of mammalia. All species of mammalia share the production of eggs that are either laid on land or retained within the mother with other members of the clade amniota, which also share a four-limbed body with all other species in the superclass tetrapoda. All tetrapods share a notochord and pharyngeal slits with all other species of the phylum chordata. This has been grossly simplified thus far, but even above the phylum level, we can continue using these similar traits to eventually place all living things that consume organic material, breathe oxygen, are able to move, reproduce sexually, and grow from a hollow sphere of cells during embryonic development in the kingdom Animalia. Even beyond the taxon Animalia, we can classify all members of that clade with all other living things comprised of cells containing a nucleus in the domain Eukaryota, where the most basic features defining living things are shared with prokaryotes as life. Each of these clades essentially marks a point in the history of life when a speciation event took place, but that still leaves the question of what exactly a species is. The most common definition used today was coined in 1942 when Ernst Mayer defined species as groups of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations which are reproductively isolated from other such groups. This definition works quite well for plants and animals that we see on a daily basis and is the distinguishing result of an experiment I covered in episode 66 when two populations of the worm Naresa cuminata, all from the same initial population of eight, were separated for over 20 years. In that time, enough genetic drift had occurred that both populations were no longer able to interbreed. This definition breaks down, however, when defining species that reproduce asexually or are only known from the fossil record or are hybrids. This definition also becomes fuzzy with regard to ring species when populations on either end of a species range are unable to breed with each other despite multiple reproductively viable populations between them. Further complicating things is the phenomenon of horizontal gene transfer between species. Although this generally only occurs in prokaryotes, it has been observed to occur between some crustaceans and echinoderms. Because of this, there are several other definitions for what constitutes a species with overlapping standards. A typological species, or morphospecies, is a group of organisms defined by specific morphological traits which they all share. This is essentially Linnaeus's method. The weakness of this method is that members of a species don't always share the same traits. For example, under lab conditions, a four-winged drosophila fly will occasionally be born 
born to a two-winged mother. This would constitute a new species, yet the four-winged variety can regularly interbreed with its two-winged contemporaries, producing both phenotypes. A recognition or cohesion species is a group of sexually reproducing organisms that recognize one another as potential mates. This doesn't mean that the genes of the two separate recognition species aren't viable, it simply means that they have no attraction. Obviously, the weakness of this definition is that plenty of individuals in the same population won't be attracted to each other, so it's difficult to know where to draw the line. In determining species among bacteria or archaea, many biologists refer to barcode species, which are defined by a genetic similarity of 98.7% or greater. This has some compelling factors when allowing for endosymbionts, which in turn may also have their own type of horizontal gene transfer. Similar to a typological species, a cladistic or phylogenetic species is useful in paleontology where only fossil evidence is available. It is the smallest group of populations that can be distinguished by a unique set of morphological or genetic traits. It makes no claims regarding reproductive viability. It also works for asexual lineages and can detect recent divergences, but it doesn't work in every situation and may lead to splitting of existing species based on unique traits. An ecological species is defined by the ecological niche it fills. The weakness of this definition lies in the fact that some species are generalists and can fill more than one niche. A genetic species is defined specifically by their genetic ability to reproduce. The weakness of this definition is that it can be difficult to determine whether a lack of reproduction is due to genetics or merely an unwillingness to mate. A chrono species, also useful in paleontology, is a single lineage whose morphology has changed over time. At some point, descendants of a single population will have accumulated enough morphological changes that they are recognized as a new species. The weakness here is that it can only be applied where a series of a lineage is represented in the fossil record. Among biologists, there is a debate as to whether viruses are alive, most contending they do not qualify. Regardless of this, they do evolve, have enormous populations, and mutate rapidly. This has led to the classifying of viruses by similar mutations as viral quasi-species. This is why every year a new cold and flu vaccine is made available using a new alphanumeric name. So yes, there are several definitions for species. Some are more commonly used than others, and they all have some degree of weakness. Where they differ from the term kind is that every definition for species is scientifically useful. We can differentiate between nearly any two species based on morphology. We can differentiate between nearly any two species based on genetics. We can differentiate between nearly any two species based on their ecological niche. And we can differentiate between nearly any two fossil species based on their appearance morphologically and chronologically. When a creationist is asked for a definition for kind, they are being asked for some kind of standard for differentiating between kinds, a set of criteria that can at least be applied generally, if not universally. This is what would actually make the term scientifically useful and possibly become another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.